Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Your Sunday evening can't be complete without your Darprim on TV. Welcome to The Advocate on Plus TV Africa. It's a panel of five with five topical issues. Definitely five thoughts-provoking topics discussed in an atmosphere of seriousness, decisiveness and laughter. But calling a spade by its name. Like we say here, no holes barred. Today, I'll be talking about the leadership loop in Nigeria. Evans is not in Ukwani today, but however, he's just coming from the rabbi and is bothered by the prevalent power of foolish people in our polity. The issue of population planning is on the mind of Bolahon, while Liberus is shouting from the rooftop as he draws our attention to the recolonization of Nigeria by the Chinese. And finally, Jumoke, in her controversial self, is asking who the Nigerian Senate is representing. We know you're here with us. We'll be back soon. Between ancient and modern, the leadership loop in Nigeria. It is disturbing to hear the youth discountenance the old and experienced in governance and the management of life generally. The conversation is recurring everywhere, and so I've chosen to address it today. In my book, Memories of Grandma, I reiterated the saying that, meaning there's a place for both the old and the young in life. And this underscores the principle of interdependency between the old and the young. While the young in Nigeria, now known as the Sorosuke generation, may say technology has changed the face of everything, it must be stated that this has not nullified the wisdom that experience brings from the elderly. Rather, it complements it. The good book says, the glory of young men and women is their strength, but the splendor of old men is in their gray hair. In other words, wisdom is often associated with age and experience, although there are some exceptions. The older you get, the wiser and better you become. So imagine a situation where you marry the two, experience and contemporary knowledge and technology. History is rich with important lessons the youth can learn from. Let's look at the success story of Latif Jaconde, a transformational leader. Who would have thought that he did all that he did in four years on a single term of administration of Lagos State and in the days of limited technology for that matter? While reference is often made to this, have we forgotten also that Alaji Jaconde had his tutelage under Chief Obafemi Awolowo, who's renowned for building the premier university and television house in West Africa? Any surprise that Latif Jaconde established Radio Lagos, LTV, and constructed the state secretariat Alausa. He also built the truly low cost housing estates in Lagos within those four years. Indeed, the youth have a lot to learn from history and experience, especially with regards to leadership. In my early days on this program, we had a conversation about it. And two weeks back, Chuka's advocacy titled Africa, My Africa, reiterated the need for young ones to read up and learn from past leaders. I heard that familiar scoffing again. As I mused over this disturbing trend, I stumbled on Reverend Sam Adiemi's post on Twitter. I thought to myself, aha, my tribe. 
He said, what the elders see sitting down, a child cannot see if he leapt up as high as he could, is a proverb that the young love to counter gleefully with technological advancement. They'll tell you, well, we use the drone to see everywhere. Truly, a drone can pick any object from far away. However, that's figuratively. There was a radio Kudarat before there was a radio Sorosuke. The thinking is the same, only that one, because of the times, is online. For the purpose of comparison, Governor Yahya Bello is said to be 45 years old, having been born in 1975, and Pa Jakonde was 50 when he governed Lagos. Both of them were relatively young. How come Jakonde was able to do all he did in four years, and in the sixth year of Yahya Bello, all we see is titular chest adulation and TV commercials, or being this and that, nothing concrete on ground. Prime Minister of Dubai, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum is 71 years old. At the time the building of Dubai started, it was much younger. I'm, and so I'm throwing back the enough is enough slogan back at our youth in governance. Enough of posturing. If you can't best the records of people like Aolo or Sam Bakwe, Jack Onde, Meitama Sule, and the rest of them, don't discredit the experience of the old and don't scoff at their contribution or their history. In other words, the horse at the rear takes its bearing from the one ahead. You point a finger at the elderly saying they're old school, four of those are pointing right back at you. So we say, let's see what you can do in the shortest possible time with technology. We will try it. <laughs> we will really try. Well, I think this advocacy is very timeless uh, in the sense that um, We've had this running battle between the old and the young as regarding who is um, most relevant in the scheme of things in leadership. The discussion actually would have been unnecessary if actually after the colonial master left off with the elderly, they were able to organize Nigeria adequately such that the young of today will respect them effectively. Respect them effectively on the line because today you find a, a clear sum, not all the elderly, but a clear sum of them who have not done well at all. The, the, the little that the young met well was what the colonial masters left off. So, so that in itself has also inspired that rebellion. Mm. But I think that uh, while we, we, we understudy the issue, we must not discountenance the contribution of the elderly. But the elderly also, they can be very reckless sometimes. <laughs> They should never discountenance the contribution of youth in the scheme of things and in the economy of the Nigerian state. For me, um, this is, is, is a, it's a recurring decimal. And the young people have always been saying, oh, we want the opportunities. It's not as if those opportunities have not been there, really. Uh, some of these governors, like you mentioned, Yahaya, he was the youngest governor when he was voted. We've had governors who even became governor earlier. We have a, a Rutimi Amechi was first a speaker before eight years as a governor, before becoming a minister. So while by the time he was in the assembly in River State, he was a young man, a very young man. We have a Bauer who has been uh, um, authorized to be the chairman of EFC. Controversially, yesterday. though. Controversially. So it's another platform to say, look, that level of responsibility, I, I, don't, I don't think it has been given to somebody that young in this republic. Will he live up to it? You, you, you see, uh, there's really no need for this debate. Um, there's no need whatsoever for it. Um, we're just deceiving ourselves. Because every old person you see today was, was, once, young. Young. was once young yeah. and in governance. Mm. They were in governance while they were young. And How failed. old was, was Buhari when he became federal minister? And, failed. and even the young people today, the young ones today who are shouting, and the ones that have been given opportunity are also the same. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's really no need for the debate. They're the same like how... I... The ones that... Look, you gave example with Yaya Bello. Mm -hmm. okay. Is that a representative of the young? 
<laughs> yeah, well, he, he was. He was. <laughs> yes, but yeah, that's what he I'm was saying. such a bright. So of, that's what I'm you saying. Know, this you house gave example. Fallen. You gave example with Amechi. Mm. We had Sanusi you, at the, as the speaker of the House of them, Assembly when he was you young. Have them, and we had the Meiji Bank calling. So that's what I'm telling you. He was in his 30s. Yes, 30s. What did he do? So what is the scorecard? What did so, he do? So it's me, about competence, not age. Essentially, it's, it's the, the problem it's, has never been age. That's, it's, that's not, the it's not about age. You have people who, at their 70s, are doing so well as if they're in 30s. And then you have 30 years who are so laid back and so backward in their thinking as though they were 80. So what we should be looking out for, for me, really, is not the age. If you even if you take some ask some people, they will tell you even the Sarasoke was a failure because the young people did not look back in time to learn. Precisely mm -hmm. the points I'm making. They say we're on You rocks. cannot discountenance the experience of the old. And it, the way yes. to not discountenance yeah, that yes. is to return to what they've done in the past and learn from it so that you don't make the I same mistakes. I tried correcting one. He told me, look, if you people can't support us, mm. get out. Some even uh -huh. think that theirs was the I, first protest yes, in I Nigeria. I told him, I said, that's why I said before the first time. Okay, there was a radio <laughs> Kudira. We I have think, been protesting. The young, we have protested at the SAP riot. IBB must go That's June twelfth, and ah. and so. Well, said, what did you people do for us? What did we do for you? No, you yes. are saying that all the things, things you are enjoying <laughs> today it's were not the a very old man. <laughs> <where, where laughs> <from. Those laughs> you see, it is sad these days that I look at the university and I see nothing. These are young people who want to take over, and I see nothing. No every awareness. Young student, every young student union activist now. You, they want to, to ride big cars like the politicians that they are criticizing. Because they their fathers have materialized that is even where in Nigeria. They but yes. when we did activism in the university, I'm not comparing, but I'm saying there's no need but for you can debate. compare. There's Look nothing back, wrong with that. Learn from what you're, where you're coming from so that you can shape the future better. Until you do that, you will just... Um, Our make... young people must go back and read. After the break, Evans goes to the rabbi. Rabbi handed over some scrolls to me last year, and there I studied the works of one of his acquaintances, George Carlin, who said, never underestimate the power of the foolish people, for if they are men in a country, they will elect a president. So I speak on the power of foolish people. My attention was drawn recently by Lassisi Olagunju to a folk tale on fools recorded by the poet A.K. Ramanujan in his folk tales from India. There was a kingdom of fools. In this kingdom, both the king and his ministers were idiots. They reversed everything and denied justice to their people. They changed the day into night, and night into day. They order their people to sleep during the day and walk only after dark. Anyone who disobeyed this order will be put to death. The people did accordingly for the fear of being sentenced to death. One day, two men, a priest and his assistant, visited the kingdom and found everything in reverse order. They were surprised to see all the people sleep in broad daylight. And when darkness fell, everyone became active. Their surprise doubled when they went to the market and found that everything cost the same. This is no place for us. Let us leave, the priest told his assistant, who, however, said, he was not ready to leave the place of good and cheap food. These people here are all fools. This thing you enjoy won't last. Fools are dangerous people. Soon, they will visit their idiocy on you, the priest said to his assistant, and left the kingdom. One day, a thief broke into a rich merchant house, 
by making a big hole in the wall. But as he was going out with his loot, the wall of the old house collapsed on his head and killed him on the spot. The brother of the thief was mad. He came running to the king and pleaded with him to punish the merchant for not building a good and strong wall. The merchant was brought before the king. The king heard the case and found the merchant guilty of the thief's death. The merchant, in his allocutus, put the blame on the bricklayer who built the wall. The bricklayer pleaded with the king to punish a dancing girl who distracted him when he was building the wall by going up and down that street all day with her anklets jingling. The dancing girl, now an old woman, was brought to the court. She put the blame on the goldsmith. She told the king that she had given some gold to the goldsmith to make some jewelries for her, but he delayed the work and made her walk up and down to his house several times. The goldsmith was produced before the king. After hearing the accusation against him, he said he should not, blame, he should not be blamed for the lady's up and down behavior. A new stake was ordered to be ready for the execution of the merchant. But it turned out that the merchant was too thin to fit the stake. So the king ordered that a fat man be searched for. The king's eyes fell on the priest's assistant, who had fattened himself for months of cheap food. He pleaded with the king that he was innocent, but his pleadings were of no use. While he was waiting for death, he remembered his boss, the priest, and communed with him in the spirit. The priest arrived at once to save his aid. He whispered something in his disciples' ears. Then the priest did the unthinkable. He requested the king to execute him first. When the servant heard this, he said that he was brought here before his master, so he, he should be put to death first. The king was surprised to see the, the fight between the boss and his boy over who should be executed first. When the king asked them the reason, the priests, you know, hesitantly told him that whoever died on the stake first would be reborn as the king of that country. The one who died next would be the minister of the country. The king was puzzled and alarmed. He did not want to lose the kingdom to someone else in the next life. So he discussed the matter with his ministers. You know, greed and inordinate love for power are manifest symptoms of foolishness. Like African, you know, life president. This foolish king and his ministers arrive at the conclusion that they should go to the stake, be executed, be reborn as kings and ministers, and live happily thereafter in power and glory. I shall go to rabbi again. Yeah, you better to, you come back from back. the rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> come back from the rabbi and explain this your story. Um, um, you see, um, what Nigeria need now is um, a priest. A wise one. A priest, uh, as described in that story, that will come and... Um, Whisper, <laughs> so that the foolish leaders can go to the stake. Who wants? Yes, can go to the stake, and then Nigeria will be free. Amen. It's not, uh, it's not about to happen. It would, but it will not happen uh, because, uh, unlike that kingdom, the ones you have here, are they are foolish, but they surrounded themselves with um, some wise people who are so much in love. With power. No, they are in love with money. So mm. they take money from the coffers 
to, to finance their stay in office. So it will be difficult. So that's why the people, it is the people now who must rise and insist, just like the minister for, uh, sorry, the chief of defense staff has said, mm. it is the people that must rise now and defend themselves against the king. Uh, the, the series of blame game was also a very interesting part to the story. Yes. You know, it, it was this, no, it wasn't this, it should be blame on that, on that, on yeah. that. And he's actually accusing the owner of the house. Yes. And, and, and we have a, a whole lot of that. Walls. And the king was hearing the matter. Uh -huh. <laughs> we have a whole lot of that in the society, in, in our society. True. People not being able to take responsibility True. for what is, has been committed to them. Rather, they will look for who to hang the blame up, up, upon. And so for six years, problem. we have been, you know, tossing and turning blame game here. Yes, it was 16 years of PDP. After that, it was this person. Was in the fact, the president came out yesterday to even say that it is the fraudulent people online that are causing insecurity in Nigeria. It yes. is well, oh, and then, Nigeria, my people. And then there's food insecurity, there's uh, the general insecurity. Even when our troops decide to fight back, they fall from the sky. Mm, so that is the blame game. <laughs> <laughs> to continue on. May God help us. Amen. Bolaho is up next after the break with the population planning on his mind. Be fruitful and multiply. Last December, I got involved with an NGO's work involving identification of some troubled kids through the school system, reaching out to these kids and their parents to provide some support, food and school needs for the immediate empowerment for the longer run, and in between, counseling both the kids and their parents. I followed a small group to three of the families. COVID prevention protocols were duly observed. Um, there was a common denominator to the three families. Too many children than the family could cater for. The first family lived in an uncompleted building surrounded by bush. Ordinarily, um, if I did not visit the place and was just told that someone lived there, I would assume that the resident must be a mental health patient. The family head had no stable means of livelihood. While the wife does some petty trading, you, you know the trader money kind of uh, target, um, you need to see the shock on my face when the children started to march out. They were 10. I learned nine were siblings and one in was inherited from a late sister. They were poor, very poor. Um, it was similar with the two other families, uh, Orbit, uh, not with many children, not with as many children as the, as the first one, but with glaringly much more children than they could cater for. The part that wasn't so obvious in the day of the visit was serial domestic abuse of the wives and children by the fathers. But over the few weeks of the counselors working with these families, the abuse situations have come to the fore. The more I get to know about my society, the more I know that I don't know much. Before these encounters, I could have said rather ignorantly that a Southwest family living in Lagos will not contemplate nine children, and that it is something that you will find in the North. How wrong I was. Having said that, though, it is glaring that the problem is a much bigger menace in the North than what we have in the South. Even a security guard from that part of town in one of my former employment said he had over 20 children with a 40,000 per month salary. He lived in Lagos for 11 months of the year, and I just wonder how he was raising 20 children back in Kano. When I think about this experience, about this experience and I situate it with the promise of government to pull out 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in 10 years, Without specific policies in the direction of population management, it appears government just like the sound of promises with no sincere desire to make them come to pass. Social welfare, trade and money, and other conditional cash transfer programs are helpful, but they will not be enough to put people out of poverty. Modern economic planning is highly integrated, and a plan to pull 100 million out of poverty Without population planning is a huge joke. As population continues to grow faster than the economy, 
and we are producing more people with no education or skills, the poverty circle will actually continue to expand rather than shrink. I wish to advocate that we must take the issue of population planning much more serious. We don't even know for sure how close or far from reality is our population estimate. If we're going to pull 100 million people out of poverty, a start point is to know how many people are even in Nigeria. It appears we have just been multiplying without being fruitful. Nigeria is due for a census. Mm. Mm. Nigeria was due for a census in 2016 because since 1966, we've had a census conducted every 10 years. Yes. But in 2016, President Buhari said we didn't have the funds. And I'm not sure that they've planned since five years, you know, to have a census done. Maybe they do not realize the importance of it in terms of planning for health care and education. Or maybe they realize expansion. The and, oh. and, and maybe we should ask government how they come by our budgets and income capital per head but, when the last census conducted was in Nigeria, 2006. Was 2006. So how do they really, what is the economic plan of Nigeria? No, are we no, planning? They have politicized. Or we are the just, no, but, uh, we, but we have um, a Bureau of Statistics. Exactly. So, so just adding so figures. Bureau of Statistics, I mean, so what can, they do projection. is from 2006, every year uh, they just project. Don't forget uh, that the foundation from which they are even projecting is flawed. It's all those uh, politicized but, numbers. Um, uh, where Professor Wallace Inka once said that um, the Nigerian budget, um, that people, that the Nigerian budget were guesstimates, as we're Isn't guessing it? the it estimates. Is. Um, and so everything about Nigeria is guesstimated. So when are we going um, to stop that so, thing, guesstimation? So <laughs> um, we will say estimate population of Lagos. Last year you estimate to 15 million. million. Now you uh, have estimated 20 to 15, 20 million. Next year we estimate to 25 million. Every year, you just add five, five million. And so, but when you want to plan, just tell the people what they want to hear. We'll pull 200 million. These are statements made during campaigns. God and bless you, sir. After, after election, when you, you dare confront them with such statement, it's either they tell you it was not from them, but their party, uh -huh. or that you are a detractor. Full stop. That you're trying to derail them from the focus now that they have. We don't even know the number of people living below poverty level. Is this we don't even know the number of people, the number of workers we have in Nigeria. We don't know the number of students. We don't know the number of children that are born daily. So how do you now plan? Pathetic, how really? can you how be, do you plan? What are you planning? This, is, this is thing is very this is annoying. We are just so we are just but you see, you are see, see as you are saying this is annoying we're me so much. We're multiplying we're not sure whether we're fruitful even. It's, it's annoying me so we're much because it's annoying me so much because I think that with the level of poverty that there is in Nigeria. Government million. should have a complete vertical impetus, proper accounting process. For the citizens, for the economy, for the resources, for rabbi, everything rabbi that we have. Speaking. And then bring it to rabbi the fore. Uh, 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 what, what exactly are we, are we doing as a country? Nothing, sir. What exactly, uh, like, like, you, like, yeah. like you said, who, who, are, who are these people representing? Nothing. Is it us or them? I don't understand. Nothing vertical <laughs> or horizontal. Perpendicular. It is all, no, neither is it perpendicularly <laughs> impetuous, <laughs> impetuously. The only Ever thing vexed. here is they will tell you that there is no money. Always no money and always but borrowing. But government court will not cut But I have enemies. a question yeah. before we round off. How do you, as a parent... Create 20, 25 children. Even if you are a farmer. Procreate. And you can feed all of them from your farm. Um, do How do care. you educate them? Even do if your education care. is informal, that is passing do on care. your One own. One thing you don't understand. They don't educate them. For that the is the reality. Do you, from care, you are lucky. You are lucky mm -hmm. that you are educated and you are from where you are from, your parents. There are some people, they will tell you child children is from God. Yes, biological don't. accident. So yeah. they are from God. They come, they should come. Secondly, your cultural practice, religious practice, yes. Polygamy. all of these are in the mix. So they don't care. They will tell you and God, highly the children will come with whatever they will so eat. So whose responsibility is it to change our mindset? Some will tell you, imagine a child telling the, you... The, it the, is, it's, it's not the, the government's responsibility, The government though. has a role. It is. The there are family planning issues. Education. That, there are campaigns in and China, awareness. There's, there's, and it's, 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 in it's, China, there's a plan on ground for, okay, um, for tail population. 
The, the, well, the advocate okay. is uh, better with your participation. Uh, it is now time to share some of your viewpoints on the issues discussed here. Responding to the advocacy on corruption as Kom Chopo, I am Uche Chow says, all talk and no action. Nigerians must learn to be proactive in calling a spade a spade until we have people that can say things the way they are and call things what they are without fear of the bad people in government coming after them. On the advocacy on the arrest of peaceful protesters, Chris, Chris Bay, 2021, says, why don't you call journalists push for obedience? Why don't you so-called journalists push for obedience? You talk about Nigerian constitution, how about bylaws? You also use the word massacre at the Lekki Gate. I'm utterly disappointed in you. For your interest, Lekki Gate is above one man. You guys are targeting. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the advocate NG. After the break, Liberos is pointing out a new form of colonization in Nigeria. According to Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State in America, Africa must beware of new colonialism as China expands ties to Africa. It should be about the good of all rather than the need to undermine good governance. Chinese recolonizing Nigeria. It seems the fear expressed by Hillary Clinton is gradually, is already here with us, as shown recently when the House of Representatives Committee on Local Content invited the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation and some contractors for a discussion pending investigation into an alleged breach of local content laws in Nigeria. In the execution of the $2.6 billion AKK 40 times um, 318 kilometer Kano Kaduna section of segment two of the gas pipeline project embanked upon by the current administration. Revelation made at the sitting showed that a Nigerian company, Bretes, in collaboration with a Chinese company, CPP, used the local content capacity of another Nigerian company, Bablink, an indigenous engineering company with huge capacity in engineering and gas pipeline project to bid and procure the above job in NMPC in compliance with our local content law. Only for Bretes, citing a non-existent Chinese content to surrender the entire engineering parts of the project, statutory reserve for Nigerian company, for which Bablink, the local engineering company, have been pre-qualified by NMPC and rectified by BPP to another Chinese company named Wiz China. This is in clear violation of Section 28.1 and Section 33 of the Nigerian Oil and Gas Industry Content Development Act, also known as Local Content Act. The Nigerian Immigration Act, the Nigerian Import Promotion Council Act, laws of the Federation 1990. This day happened for Nigeria. The project was originally to be financed by CPP, the Chinese company. But upon award, the Chinese company reneged on its promise to finance forcing the federal government to seek loan from the Chinese government secured with the Nigerian sovereign guarantee, i.e., if you don't pay, they take over the project despite your sovereignty. Despite Dangote fabricating pipeline in Nigeria to execute job in Cameroon and other West African countries, the Nigerian government went ahead to award a $400 million contract to, a Chinese, to the Chinese company for importation of pipelines. You borrow money from China, and give it back to China for jobs you can locally fabricate. Yet, you will pay back the loan with interest. Someone said, you get with the African leaders see for China where they never tell us. By virtue of the law cited above, most of these jobs, also known as in-country services, are supposed to be exclusively preserved for our local contractors since their profit is domiciled in Nigeria, which in turn will stimulate economic growth and create employment for our jobless graduate and youth. They are in these cases being taken over by Chinese company, all in the name of Chinese loan and non-existent Chinese content. If you take your money to China for production, you can never bring it back to Nigeria. All you get is goods. So why is our own relationship with them different? You can call it Chinese using Nigerians to defraud Nigeria and Nigerians. They are definitely spot on. 
The immediate and long-term implication of all of these to the Nigerian economy are very grave, and they include, but not limited to the following. Diminished job creation capacity at all time when the country is expected to reap the benefit of local content growth. Capital flight as an encroachment of in-country services area and repatriation of borrowed Chinese loan secured by a sovereign guarantee, including profit back to, uh, to China. This will reduce local capital available for development, hence we'll keep going back to China to borrow. Gradual phasing out of the local service industry in the oil and gas and fabrication sector. Erosion of in-country service market. Lack of technology transfer and development as the job that ought to have been reserved for locals are completely taken over by foreigners, which eventually lead to great loss of revenue to both the local companies and the government. Lack of opportunities for growth of our local industries and companies, technically not to talk of competing globally. Massive retrenchment of workers by local service contractors, thereby fueling the already existing insecurity situation. I will therefore advocate, as posited by the spokesperson of the House of Representatives, Honorable Benjamin Kalu, any law made by the parliament for the benefit of the country, it should be the interest of every person, including government and its ministries, parasitas and agencies, to see that such laws are observed to the latter for the benefit of all Nigerians. NMPC being a, a government agency created by an act of parliament should be interested in how our local content laws are applied, especially in the field it dominates. And I'm happy to say that the NMPC acting GMD is already trying to find solution to this. After all, if you allow China to repatriate 100% of the loan they are providing through payment of contract to their own local companies, same jobs your local companies can ordinarily do, don't cry when your people go sorrowing and take up arms against the state for lack of jobs and funds, as Boko Haram and bandits are already saying. And like a Kenyan would ask, this is our law for Chinese, even when we can't claim Chinese relatives as any reason for the favoritism, who they benefit? We all know the answer, but fear no let me talk am. You feel talk am, shah. Until we collectively avert this practice and ugly trend, soon our children will not only be recolonized by Chinese in their own country, they will have to beg the Chinese for food, jobs, shelter, and clothes, clothing. And here you say, God forbid. God would forbid until we and our government resist this by insisting on protecting our own laws against Chinese invasion. Hin Chuan Hun Wan Han Chuan, a word said in half, goes into the wise and becomes a whole. I feel we should go to court on this matter. As public interest litigators, we must file an action right now because local content, the essence of it in our laws is to improve our own economy and better the life of our citizens. But right now, even our local companies are undercutting the process, are conniving with foreign companies to get the contract and then you know, it, it turn it back to the Chinese and then we get loan from the Chinese. It, it, it just it's means that, yeah, this, this, this whole analysis, this whole analysis is one, it has opened a new vista for public interest litigators. I'm calling on lawyers who are public interest litigators to look at this matter, this matter critically and let's file an action uh, against the local companies, against the Chinese, and then ask the court to interpret our laws, the Mining Act, the Petroleum Act, the Local the Contact, Contact Act, Act and, and the rest of it. And let's have a judgment against this process. And let all Nigerians come out and resist this, this uh, uh, unreasonable, unnecessary uh, uh, recolonization that we are signing in for. Uh, to 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 okay. forestall. Uh, well, are, we, are we even through with the first colonization? I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, I, I uh, think we're still they're still here as 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 much as we will have loved them to 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 have left us alone. You see the way these things work. I, I once had a, a meeting with the Department of Trade, the country manager for the Department of Trade of one of the Western countries when telecoms cables first came to Nigeria, the, the landed intercontinental cables. They were going to give us some, some money. When you see the conditions attached to this money, eh, all the consultants were going to be pre-qualified by that right. country, and they were from that country. Then the primary contractors were also going to be 
qualified by these same people. The only thing they were leaving for Nigerians, you know it, the digging of ground and, 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 and whatever. Essentially, 80, 90% of that money will have gone go back, back to, that, to country. that country. So that is the way they approach this matter. It is Nigerians that will stamp our feet and say, this is how it must be. So, 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 so what, is it, what is the Bureau of Public Procurement doing? What is, what is no, the... Like, like I said, you find out that Bureau of Public Procurement, what they do, I have seen situations where, because I've been on this advocacy for local content for close to 10 years now, even in telecoms, um, telecom sector, where the same Chinese people would come as portfolio investors, bring nothing and take away so much. And you find that Nigerians will collaborate with them. A, a Chinese man will register a company. His driver will be a shareholder holding 51% because that's the position of the law. Yeah. He will hold 51%. The driver does not know anything, anything. about the company. And then he tells you it's a Nigerian-owned company. company. And then he's using it to siphon money. And so what they do, once you are able to settle, our regulatory agencies look the other way. But NMPC and um, BPE are strict. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, when you bring this thing to their attention, they address immediately. That's the reason why well, you for go For me, to I think we have a squandered economy and an economy that is perpetually being squandered. Yes, if, um, if you get one. It, it, I don't know how we're going to get out of this, but you know this present crop of leaders are... They've Just use Yoruba word. You, you have your I like account. it when you use Yoruba to... Use Yoruba to say, Kumuru Kwa No Swaya. <laughs> it's as if this country is sold. We should yeah. just give yes, it change. My That's why Bolaho said we sold to the British, <laughs> we are selling to the Chinese. The Chinese. Who bewitched Nigeria? Nobody that, bewitched Nigeria. Question. That question. Nigerians will be are answered. not bewitched, it's our leaders. That question will be answered by Jumoke after this break, as she's asking who the Nigerian Senate is representing. Let's discuss the Nigerian Senate today, shall we? I once said on live TV how I didn't know what the senator representing my constituency was doing in the Senate. He said it's called to tell me he's empowering constituents with grinding machines and motorcycles. Am I a joke to you? Are senators in the Senate to empower their party loyalists and friends? Who is the Nigerian Senate representing? When the 8th Assembly, led by Dr. Bukola Saraki, questioned and investigated issues, supporters of the Buhari government labeled him anti-government. The 9th Assembly promptly told us they would align and accede quickly to requests from the presidency. The government supporters hailed the Senate's president. Who then is to check the excesses of the presidency? What exactly is the role of the Senate in a democracy? Who is the Nigerian Senate representing? Definitely not me. But let's take all that and say that they represent their own supporters. Is it to Nigeria's advantage that her Senate is a rubber stamp? You criticize the service chiefs for insecurity in the country every day. They are removed. And then you are see to them being made non-career ambassadors. Is Nigeria a joke to you? Nigeria's former ambassador to the U.S., Professor Silvanus Nsofo, was 85 years old. He could hardly walk, talk less of being actively involved in seeing to the plight of Nigerians in the U.S. He couldn't even recite the Nigerian anthem when he was interviewed by the Bukola Saraki-led Senate. He was rejected. President Buhari sent his name again. Professor Silvanus Nsofo was the only appeal court judge who agreed that President Buhari had a case in his 2003 election petition. So it seemed President Buhari was hell-bent on rewarding him, even though he was long retired and really too old for active service when he was made Nigeria's ambassador to the U.S. in November 2017 at age 82. Indeed, he passed on in December 2020 at the age of 85. His counterpart in the UK, George Okuntade, also celebrated his 8th birthday while representing Nigeria in the UK. Yet, the Nigerian Senate doesn't see anything wrong with these representations as far as it's from their leader. I am flabbergasted. Now, we are approving former service chiefs to do what exactly? Have military diplomatic discussions on our behalf? 
Diplomacy is not a child's play. Countries around the world take it seriously. An ambassador is received in their assigned country like they are the president of the delegating country. Even though there are good reasons for appointing non-career diplomats around the world, Nigeria seems to just settle the president's supporters with these important appointments. And the Nigerian Senate just rubber stamps it. Imagine. We now reward failure. Service chiefs who totally failed at their one assignment of securing the country. Service chiefs under whom every section of Nigeria became more insecure. You want to settle them for staying loyal to the president and not Nigeria? It's Nigeria's President Buhari's private business where he does as he wishes at the time convenient for him and our National Assembly just looks on. Who is the Nigerian Senate representing? When will Nigeria stop being embarrassed by this government? I just tire. Is the Nigerian rep Senate representing you? Is the Nigerian Senate representing you? Please explain this to me. Yes, they are representing you. <laughs> I'm explaining to you now. They are representing you because you voted for them during the election. Or you chose not to. Or you chose not to. Or you look at the other fringe parties and you say... I don't want this to waste was. my votes. Mm. Exactly. I don't want to waste my votes. So let were me. They, were they really voted for that? They were they not. Voted. They were voted they for. Were voted I, I, I know that statutorily they were voted for. for. Them. Yeah, yeah. Statutorily, because they are, they even are if they rigged uh, more, uh, yeah, but they were voted for. Statutorily, they are representing us. Statutorily, but in reality, in terms of value and reward. And then competence and capacity to deliver. They are not representing. When the man they are not representing vote, their, what did he tell he was going not, to do? They are not representing their, their constituency. The otherwise, is. otherwise, you will not find them confirming uh, or about to confirm the. Bama. the I mean, the, the set of uh, service Oh, they've been confirmed already. They've been confirmed already, rather. Mm -hmm. They've yes. been confirmed they've been already. Confirmed okay. Already. And then you know that this, this same National Assembly at the outset of their administration told us that they did not come there to fight the president. Yes, sir. That I whatever the president to brings that. to them, they are going to do it. And Nigerians kept quiet. And that was when we were no, supposed no, to mobilize. No, no, no. Let's, let's, to recall let's, them. Let's paint the right picture. Recall not is this a long national, story. The leadership of the National Assembly. Yeah, the leadership. That's what I'm saying. The, uh, the principal the members. I, I, well, what's I the think, difference? I there is, there is a, a, a whole lot there are some dissenting yeah. voices, but, but they are just few. Yeah, dissenting voices. But they are just few. The dissenting voices were Number one, they are very few. Then in, in, in the crop of those people, I, mean, I saw a video by Cosmos Madoka just this morning talking about um, uh, an incident, the most regrettable business incident. Even though he didn't call names. Even though he didn't call names, we all know the person. And that person is sitting in that in that uh, yes, as, 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 as your as lawmaker. And yeah. you also have re retired governors Mm. Who have made the place a retirement home? Yes, mm. where, 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 where they're sitting. Mm. So, honestly, the quality. I think our expectation is too high for the quality of what is possible from that kind of. An the assembly. thing is, we've that's, never that's had reality. it this terrible in terms ah, of ah. government. Let, let the eyes have it. It is the same Senate that will rubber stamp a bower. For, EF, uh, for EFCC, her head of EFCC. I think Bawa even had a discussion. Bawa, I am not the saying he does chief not have a discussion. Have but you see, in the civil service, you just jumped ahead of others. You want to tell me that you didn't invest in other people, but a level 13 uh, officer? Um, really? Um, I worked in the civil service I for years. Yeah, that the care. former EFCC was denied three times by the Bukola Saraki Senate. And yeah, President Buhari, <laughs> President Buhari kept on sending his name. Meanwhile, yeah. Bukola Saraki yeah. also passed the Unsofo that you're talking about. Yes, uh -huh. he had rejected so Unsofo. Listen, Wait. he had rejected Unsofo twice. Right. The president kept on resending his name. The first time Unsofo could not even sing the national anthem. The second time, they asked him for pledge. He said, I, I was his business with that. It's for young children. See, um, wait. Let's, let's tell ourselves the truth. Truly, the national anthem is not his business. As at his time, the national anthem was not... Um, but really, well, I'm, saying this, know it's not. Yeah, I'm saying this sarcastically. I'm saying this If the man... No, if but the really. Man, when the man were competent, mm. 
What if he recites the national anthem and he knows and next to nothing? That's the point I'm going to make. What if he recites the national better. anthem? It I can better. learn it. But at it least is. he should know it. And it then I'm not competent. Is. What it's is the same a foreign same. policy trust. What I am saying Because exactly. that is what that's drives... That's need to go to. It's that's the point. It's not, it's, about, it's, 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 it's not about... Let me tell you, the problem here... Reciting the anthem. The problem here, the problem here really is the fact that the government, a government came on board on the on the crest of promises mm -hmm. to do it differently. Yes. And then the government came, rather than challenge them from day one to consistently do these things differently, we started creating excuses for their failure. On their behalf. And the, the President Buhari will um, fail to appoint ministers. He says they are noise maker. Six months. We will say, after all, when Gulag Jonathan appointed them, uh, what did they do? When he appointed early, what did they do? We kept benchmarking Buhari with failure of Jonathan yeah. as if Jonathan was so good that you need to match his <laughs> failure. Mm -hmm. So, but we didn't know that when all of this were happening, what we were gradually doing was preparing a big pot of recipe for failure. For disaster. For disaster. And so today, it has snowballed in your face. And so all the Senate is just simply doing is enjoying the ride with the president. Because it doesn't because make sense, we, we, we uh, liberals, ask that question. it doesn't make sense for the You'll Senate to we criticize to the same service chiefs perpetually, repeatedly, and then they leave, and then they had the guts to tell the Senate and Nigerians that our security issue can't even be solved in the next, in the next 20, 20 years. years. Even the, that we have a problem the, with intelligence. Even the uh, intelligence was compromised. I opened my mouth and I went like, Really? Even the petitions against them were, were, not, were not discussed. And, and, and I think that is that where is the part, main problem No, that is part of you, the excuse it's we made excuse. for Buhari. You brought Slawa. They say, yes, you need a Senate that can work with him. It is us. The day we want a better Nigeria, we will there will be up. a better Nigeria. Very not true. the leaders. Mm. We can never have enough time here on the program, but we hope our conversations resonate with you. Don't forget, the advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook, plus TV Africa. The hashtag is the Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at plus TV Africa, same hashtag, the Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, please go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the Advocate NG. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, plus TV Africa. Please join us next week, same time on the station. Let's keep advocating for a better Nigeria. We we'll see you next time. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed. It's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.